Thank you, Carolyn. Take your Bible to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. I mentioned to you, this is on the back of the bulletin. Two things let me mention to you. There's some, there's some outlines if you laid on every table. And if you want one and don't have one, just raise your hand or if you got some laying on your table not being used. Wave them if somebody wants one, they can come get it. We wind up throwing so many away, we just cut down the number that we that we run. And uh, just so you know, we uh, had the water heater that burst the other, the other morning, the other night, whenever that was, had that replaced yesterday. And so, uh, so all is good there. And uh, there's a question that we've been trying to answer. And nobody seems to know the answer to it is why there was a dishwasher in the janitor's closet. Not just being stored there, but hooked up there. <laughs> it's no longer hooked up there, but it, it was hooked up there. And I don't know if Mr. and Miss Truss eat while they come and clean. That's where they do their dishes or what happens. That was so they could wash the utensils in the nursery. Okay, uh, that, was a, that was the only guess we had. Okay. Right. Well, we un we unhooked it, so. Uh, but we wondered. I just thought it was being stored there, but but anyway, I don't remember what the other thing I was going to tell you was because that hot water heater wasn't one of them. But now you do when you get. Uh, I read a note today, Carla, that uh, your daddy sent me, and uh, I can't remember all of it. But he he wasn't going to be here on a particular Sunday, and he said. Uh, he said, stand up straight, talk, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the word was, talk some, somehow or another. And uh, he said, if you see a rabbit, don't chase it. <laughs> and uh, when you get to about 20 minutes, start wrapping it up. <laughs> or something like that. I read it this evening on something I run across. <coughs> All right. Oh, I remember what the other one was. Sunday night, uh, the kids and grandkids are going to be here. They're going to sing in our Sunday evening service, so hope you'll come and uh, be a part of that. If, you, if you've heard their CD, I'm, I don't tell you they're good because I'm their grandfather. Uh, I tell you they're, they're pretty good because they're, because they're pretty good. And I uh, believe, it'll, believe it'll be a blessing to you. Talking tonight, First Peter, this, this, this letter, this epistle, is, is sort of divided into, into three different sections. And I, I left a place up at the top of your outline of, uh, of how it was broken down. And, and the first section, from 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 over to chapter 2 and the 10th verse, he talked about our precious salvation. And we talked about that precious salvation that we have and what we have in Christ. And, and, and it's so precious that, that it should demand the best not us to go out and pat somebody on see the pants and go say go do the best you can but, but it ought to be the very best that we can do we ought to do it for the Lord because because of this precious salvation we have then beginning in chapter 2 verse 11 we, we talked for several weeks about living a godly life and uh, and, and a holy life in, in the midst and, and you remember all the different things about this group of people that Peter's writing to and and, and all the things that's going on in their life and they're being persecuted and, and all of those things. And, and so he tells them, he says, regardless of your present situation, live a holy life. And what was one of the things, you, you remember what one of the things were that were included in that section? I can't remember if it's chapter 2, the first part, or chapter 3. I think it's chapter 3, the first part, where he begins talking about the husband and the wife. You remember that? And, and so whatever the situation is, okay, we are, we're, we are to live, live a, a holy life. We're to be a witnessing group of people, and it doesn't matter how difficult it gets. So that brings us to the third section. And in this third section, uh, Peter begins, he's still talking to the same group of people. The audience doesn't, doesn't change from one section to the other, but, but in this section... He talks about that we ought to go on with our Christian living focused on the Word of God and upon Christ and upon holiness, not only because of our precious salvation and not only because of our present situation, but because of His second coming. You didn't hear me? 
We need to continue with our Christian living because of his second coming. Amen. The, the, the Bible tells, and, and this is not the first time that Peter has mentioned the second coming. He doesn't get to chapter 4, verse, verse 7, and, and then begin to pick up the subject. In fact, he, he, he begins to talk about it uh, several different times. Let me see, I, I think I marked them down. Back in chapter 1, in the fourth verse, he, he, he said this, he, he, he talked about the fact that there was waiting for us an inheritance. It's imperishable, undefiled, it will not fade away, and it is reserved where? In heaven for us. Then in the same chapter, the 13th verse, he said, Gird up, your lo gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully on the grace. Now listen to the end of that verse. It says that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then in the second chapter, the 12th verse, he talks about a day of visitation. That's not a day when the church committees all call everybody to come down to the church to go out and knock doors. What he's talking about is the day when, when we face God and that day is going to come. Do you believe that? Yes. I hope you do. There is a time. There is a time that's going to come when Jesus is coming and Peter has alluded to that thing. And, and, and we know in Scripture, we don't know exactly when, but he said we can, we can sort of know the season of it. Now, my daddy worked for the Texas Foundry. Some of you, how many of you were paper mill guys? Any paper, several paper mill guys. And I know you weren't stuck to this shift, but paper mill had 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7. Texas Foundry didn't, or, or Dad's department didn't work by that schedule. They, they would go, Tom, he, he would go about 6 o'clock in the morning. And his get-off time was not a set time, but it was an, an about time. If everything went good and you didn't have to do anything extra and nothing broke down and none of those things happened, the get-off time was about 2 o'clock. Or it could be 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. Well, normally, especially in the summertime, Dad would, he, he really didn't see any sense in you laying in the bed if he had to get up and go to work. So he made provision for you. To, I didn't have to get up at four or anything like that, but he made provision that you would go ahead and get up. And you would begin to do this list of things that he normally said, now tomorrow, while I'm at work, you do A, B, and C. Well, when I, did, when I would get up and get over here, and our garden was over here at my grandmother's house, and whether it was tasks to do at the garden or tasks to do at the cows or whatever it was, when I would get there at, seven o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever it was. I didn't get in a hurry, Wilbur. I just didn't get in a hurry. If, it was to, if my task that day was to mow the yard, I, I didn't just kill myself at eight o'clock in the morning to, to mow the yard. And if it was to work in the garden, I didn't hold very fast, Ryan, at eight o'clock in the morning. But, but as that clock ticked around and it got close to noon and then it got close to two, you began to react in what you thought was going to happen. Now, you didn't know exactly when it was going to happen, but you picked up the pace when the time approached. Now, that in, as far as I know, he never had a new pickup. Well, he may have the very last one that he, that he had. That may have been a brand new one. Other than that, I don't know that he ever owned a new pickup. In those years of my life, he drove a three-quarter ton Ford, three, uh, yeah, three-quarter ton, and you could hear it a long time before you could see it. Not because it had pipes, just because it squeaked. And, and this was just a little old, what's the name of that road, Ryan? Lone Star Road. Didn't have a name back then. It was Momoff's Road. Okay? <laughs> the only name it had. It's the only name I knew it by. But, but you could hear it. When he would get about to your house, if I was outside, he'd get up to about Max and Evelyn's and then your house and get to the trailer park, you could hear him coming. So if you were sitting under the, uh, under the tree there in the edge of the garden, you didn't sit there and prop your feet on the, on the bucket sitting there and wait for him to walk out and say, what's up, Pops? You got up and you cranked the tiller, you grabbed the hose, 
you, 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 you grabbed your picking gloves, if you was picking or whatever it was, but you got, you got busy because the time had approached. Well, I, I, want you to, I want you to listen and see, hear what Peter says when, when, when we get to this place. We're, we're talking about, and, and, and this is what he's talked about all through this, this little letter. It's called an epistle, but it's a letter. And he has told this same group of people, he says, if you're going to do your Christian duty, he said, if you're going to do your Christian duty, you've got to know how precious your salvation is. Now, I'm going to tell you something tonight. It hadn't changed. If we tonight, the 80, 90, 100 of us that are sitting in this room, if we're going to do our Christian duty, we have to know how precious our salvation is. Because if it's not precious to us, it's not going to mean much to us, and we're not going to do anything in return. So, so if you're going to do your Christian duty, you've got to know how precious your salvation is. You, you, you've got to know that, that he has left you in this situation. Peter talked to those people, and he, he referred to them as aliens or strangers, sojourners, pilgrims. He says, he says you, you've got to know that, that God has left you in this, in this present situation to lead other people to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, listen, this, this, this yang yeah, yeah stuff about people telling us we don't need to witness to certain people. Has God sent you a memo that there's a certain group of people that his grace is not going to reach? He hasn't sent it to me. I didn't get it. It's not in here. Now, I know that he knows that there are people who are going to say yes. and those He knows that, but he hadn't revealed that to me. So what's our duty since he's not revealed that to us? That's exactly right. We need to be witnessing to everybody. Everybody, every color, every creed, everyone. That's what we need to be doing. So if we're gonna if we're gonna fulfill our Christian duty, how precious your salvation is. Share that salvation. Share your witness with somebody else. And then he gets to this part and he says, Now you've got to live. You've got to live out your days in light of the soon return of Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Steve, I'm 70 years old, I'm 80 years old, I'll just use me. A couple of weeks, three weeks or so, I'll turn 57. And I cannot tell you any period of time in those 57 years, and I think whatever age you're, you are, that you can make the same proclamation, there has never been a time in any of those 57 years that I have not been told, heard, preached to, or taught that Jesus was coming soon. I've heard it all my 57 years. But you know what? They were proclaiming that Jesus was coming soon 2,000 years ago. Now, Peter comes along in this passage of Scripture, and he begins the seventh verse this way. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Your translation may have the word near. It may, it may say the end of all things is near. Listen to me tonight. That is the incentive because the end is near. That was the incentive to get up out of the chair sitting in the, under the shade tree at the garden. The incentive was dad was just a quarter mile down the road down there where Ryan lived, and that was the incentive to get up and get going. It was the incentive if, if your daddy worked at the paper mill and he got off at 3, long about 3.30, 3.45, that was the incentive to get up because you didn't want him to find you sitting under the shade tree sipping on a glass of lemonade waiting for him who had worked all day to come home and see that you hadn't done anything. Well, this is our incentive. And Peter said the end of all things is at hand. The Greek word for this word end is the word telos. It, it, it can be translated various ways, and, and it can be translated just with the, word, with the word end. You've all seen, remember watching Bugs Bunny? And the little Bugs Bunny cartoon, not the movie, but I think they made a movie, didn't they? Yeah, not that. The old cartoon. When he would get to the end of that cartoon, and he was down in his hole, ch jumping on a carrot or two, and, 
And then whoever made the cartoon, was it Warner Brothers? Yes. yes. That little circle would begin to appear right there in the middle of your television screen and it would grow and the words would show up in that thing, the end. Now what did that mean? Was it the end of Bugs Bunny? No. Because if you caught the first episode, as soon as they played a commercial or two, that's when Bugs Bunny was going to come along and do his thing with Elmer Fudd and all of those things. And Elmer was going to hunt a wagon. So he was coming back, so it wasn't the end end. It was just that episode had ended. Well, when, when, when we get this word in, it, 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 it could convey just end. It could convey just that something was ceasing. It could convey the idea of something being terminated, but it's neither one of those things because this word, end, in, in, in the Greek, is never used of anything temporal. It's never used as the, at the end of a government. It's never used as the end of a, a, an event, per se. It's never used as some sort of chronological end. And, and it never means that something just stops. Here's what it means, and here's what it speaks of. It's the consummation of something. It is talking about the end. It's not the end until the next episode starts. It's not the end of, the, of, of all the Western shows on the Western Channel on Saturday. It's not the end until they get the next Western keyed up to, to follow it as soon as the commercial. It, it's not that end. He's talking, about, he's talking about it's over. He says the end is near. It, it carries the idea of a goal being achieved. Some, the result has been attained. The, the purpose has been fulfilled. It's, it has the idea of fulfillment. It's not just the end of something. It's the end of everything as we know it. And Peter said, the end of all things is near. Now, you know, and I'm trusting that you believe this as well, that the Bible's inspired, infallible, and without error. Isn't it? If that's so, and the Holy Spirit of God because the Bible is God-breathed. Nothing got there by accident. Even the begots. I'm not certain why they're there. I don't enjoy reading them. But they're there. They have a purpose. And the Holy Spirit said they need to be there. So they're there. So when Peter comes along here. And he begins to speak to this group of people. And he says, hey. The end of all things is near. He is saying the consummation of all things is near. If it was near 2,000 and whatever the other handful of years would be, if it was true 2,000 years ago, how true is it today? But rather than us believing it more than they did 2,000 years ago, we've adopted the mindset, well, I'm speaking for me, I've heard that for 57 years, and he hadn't come yet. So what is the mindset of, of, of the culture, which is rapidly becoming the mindset of the church? He must not be coming. Wasn't it the Pope a year or two ago? He said there's nothing to that. Peter says the end of all things is is near. So what's it pointing to? It's pointing, I believe, to the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. The glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it takes us back into that and back into that first chapter again, in the fifth verse where, where Peter writes and he says, We are kept. You, you may have the word protected. We are kept or we're protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed, guess when? In the last time. 1 Peter 1, 7. We will be found in praise and glory and honor at the revelation. Not the, not the book of revelations we have in the Bible, but at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so he has the revelation of Christ 
which is another way of, of, of talking about the second coming. He's got it connected with the end time. And, and by the way, we, we, we sit around today and we say, well, well Brother Steve, when did the end times begin? You ready for this? You may doubt me on this one. I believe the end time began when he got here. You can chew on that. I believe the end time began when he got here. And now he's got Peter giving this word. He said, hey, the, 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 the word in, in the Greek, it's, it's, a, it's one word. You know, we, we, we were, I was talking to somebody today and how we, we have a difference in language and we have one word for love. The Greek language has at least nine. We love fried chicken, and we love our wives, we love our children, but we don't love them all the same. And the Greek word has a different, they have a agape, and I, don't, I didn't write them all down, so I can't quote all nine of them, but there's nine different things for nine different avenues, values, levels of, of love. Well, here, wh where we have this phrase is at hand, which is what most of our Bibles are, are translated at, it, it's one word in the Greek, and it's and it's the word egizo, and it simply means that it is it it, it is arriving, it, it it's here, it has come near, and, and it's in the perfect tense. So if that had been stated two thousand years ago, it would have been applicable. He, Peter didn't have to say, "I'm going to say this," but this is really not going to kick in for a couple thousand years because it was true then. And it's true tonight. And if the world stands for another year or 10 years or 100 years or whatever, or it's going to be true. If, if there's a building here and there's a pulpit here and there's somebody standing here and he stands here on a Wednesday night and they have a refueling service or whatever they call it by that time, and he stands here and he says the coming of the Lord is near, he's going to be right. Amen. He's going to be right. So Peter is reminded, you must live in anticipation of the coming of Jesus Christ. Don't you wonder this? I'm, I'm thankful for everybody that comes on Wednesday night, Sunday night. What if we knew? I mean, what if we absolutely knew? I mean, what's the national championship game the other night? I was I was for the team that lost, but that's okay. But why do we have a horse riding out of here tonight, brother? I can't talk like he talks. <clears throat> he sounds like he's got a bad, bad cold all the time. Oh, Ed Orgeron. He's a national championship coach. His salary is four million dollars a year. Before you gasp at that, he doesn't even make the top thirty of the college football coaches in America as far as salary goes. But I just have this sneaky feeling, Richard, that he will. He'll be up there with the two big boys at eight and nine million, pretty soon. Ed Orgeron comes, and he comes in here tonight. He said, Brother, you need to live in anticipation and expectancy coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't even know if he knows who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He may, may not. I, I don't know. But if he said that, and we could make that, and we could put it on Facebook, and we could put it, I don't know how many people watch Channel 9, but if we put it on Channel 9, if we put it on Fox News, we put it on, I don't know who watches CNN, but if, if anybody does, if we could put it on there, and, and we could just make it known everywhere. But we absolutely knew that Jesus was coming back tonight. You think this room would hold the number of people that would come? No. This property wouldn't hold the number of people that would come. So what does that mean, preacher? It means this. We don't live in anticipation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church, to a very large degree, Brother Vic, I believe, has bought into the idea, I've heard it for 50 years, he hadn't come. 
He may come, but it won't be in my lifetime. Peter says you need to live. If you're going to fulfill your Christian duty, you need to do so living in anticipation of the coming of the Son of Man. You say, well, Brother Steve, when's he coming? I'm just going to give you the answer. You ready? Get, get a pen because you don't want to miss this. Here's what God knew. God knew if he told us we would do just what, we, just what Steve did when his daddy went to work in the morning. When the time was a long way off, Steve would sit on a, in the lawn chair under the tree. And as the time got nearer, you began to panic. Oh, my stars. Dad will be here in an hour. And I have not done the things that Dad told me to do. So then we go from being lazy and doing nothing to panicking and almost killing ourselves. So God in his infinite omniscience, that means he doesn't study about anything, he doesn't wonder about anything, he just knows everything. So in his wise omniscience, he just says, hey! I don't know how you say ain't in the Hebrew nor the Greek, but whichever language he would have spoken, he said, I ain't telling you. So we have this verse of scripture from the writing of Paul. We know that Luke was the transcriber. He's the one writing it down. But, but he said this, and, and, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father, the Father has put in his own authority. So, so we don't know when it is. We just know that we are supposed to live in true expectancy of his coming. Well, you say, well, what else do we need to do? That's our incentive. Well, he gives us instructions. How, how we're to, what our duty is in our world, we have the, we have the incentive, live as, live as though Jesus is coming, and it could be today. But then he gives some instruction, beginning in the latter part of the seventh verse. And, and this instruction goes from the middle of the seventh verse, where I quit reading a while ago, it goes to the eleventh verse, the first part of that. And he's giving us the instructions for godly living. How do you conduct yourself? And, and listen, most, I, I hope you did. I hope you had a godly mom and a godly daddy and godly grandma and a godly grandpa, but that's not the way we conduct ourselves. We are to conduct ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis the way that the Word of God gives us instruction. So how do we do that? How do we live that kind of life? And how do we, how, how do, we do that? How do we become the disciples and those things? Well, what, what, he, what Peter's going to do here is he is going to break this down into three different categories. There's a spot for them on your outline. And, and he tells us to do this. The first thing we need to do is we need to live holiness. Practice holiness. Personal holiness. Now, now what does this personal holiness... You say, well, holy is not in my Bible. Well, the, the word's not there, but the application's there. You see, this personal holiness has to do with our relationship to God and his revealed word. That's what this personal holiness has to do. So, so it, here's the first part of that verse 7. Therefore, because, because the end of all things is near. Now here begins the instruction. You ready for it? Be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Now, now, Sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer would mean that my life is to be so pure and so right that I am in constant communion with God. Constant communion with God. You say, well, what is this, what is this sound judgment thing? Well, the term comes from a word that means to say. It, it actually comes from two words. One of the words means to save, and the other word has to do with the mind. If you put one and one together, you get two. So if you put if you put save and then you put mind, guess what you come up with? <clears throat> You're right. Save the mind. 
Some of you ladies are saying, well, bless God, my husband doesn't use his enough. He is undoubtedly planning for a holy life because he's unsaving his mind. What, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Let's get, we're to, we, listen, guard this thing. Guard it. Randy, you sent me the message about the commercials on television last Thursday morning after we left here Wednesday night. And, and, and I made mention to you, I think I mentioned it again on Sunday, that you can hardly watch a television commercial. There's, a, there's not a man hugging a man and a woman hugging a woman. If we don't begin to make the proclamation of sin in the church and we don't follow that up by the documenting it in the home, this generation of our little grandkids and, and the ones that are coming along behind this, they're not going to know that there's anything in the world wrong with that. Because it is being shoved down our throats and it's being shoved down our, in our homes. It, it's, in, it's, in, it's almost in every program that you watch. So the word of God, and listen, God, remember, he's omniscient. So through Peter here, he begins to give this word and he's given it to this group of people. And I don't understand the total reason that he's given it to them. But I can certainly understand the application for it in 2020. Is it 2020? 2020? 2020. I understand the application for 2020. Now we've got to guard our mind. And that's, that's what that word is. We've got to be of sound judgment. Guard your mind. Protect your mind. Keep your mind clear. And another way to put it would be to, to fix your mind on spiritual things. You know, the word of God talks about that. In Colossians, the third chapter, the second verse, it depend, and this third word will depend on your translation, but it says, set your affections. Now, that word affections is the Greek word proneo, and it just means to exercise your mind or just your mind. So it says, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. She said, Preacher, how do we guard our mind? How do, we, how do we protect our mind? How do we keep our mind clear? You've got to keep the world's junk out of it. And you do that by keeping your mind on things above. And that above, I think, is talking about spiritual things. And, and listen, Peter's not done talking about this because as he goes down and after he finishes with this little phrase, be of sound judgment, he says, and have a sober spirit. Now, we're quick to throw that word sober into, into some alcohol set because that's, that's the way that it's primarily used in, in our world. But it basically means, well, it, it kind of does mean that. But what it means is, is to have a clear head. Have a clear head. Take serious things seriously. Do you get that? Take serious things seriously. Be vigilant. Be alert. And I'm telling you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is serious. It's serious. So we need to take serious things seriously. Jesus talked about this. In Matthew 24, 42, he used this phrase, be on the alert. Be watchful. In, in Matthew 26, 40 and 41, he says, be watching. That, that means to, 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 to see what's going on around you and, and to see all of these things. And, and, and listen, Peter is greatly concerned uh, about this matter of, because he, he, he used these things. If you look at that verse, he said, be of sound mind and a sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. For the purpose of prayer. You remember back in the third, we were talking about the husband and the wife. And you get down there to that seventh verse, and he says, you, you better get your, I'm paraphrasing this. He said, you better get your marriage together. You better get your stuff together. And he told them why. He said, so that your prayers aren't hindered. Now, I know we wouldn't say this aloud, but I'm going to assure you that there's multiple somebodies in this room. There would be, if this were a Sunday morning and we talked about this very thing in the big room, and if the big room were full, there would be numbers of people that would say, ah, ain't nothing to that. 
there's enough to it that the Holy Spirit of God allowed it to be included into the counsel of the Word of God. Were it not important, I believe it would have fell under that section of Scripture where the Bible tells us that the volumes can't contain all of the things that were said and were and that occurred. But I'm going to tell you tonight that that, that our sound judgment and, and, and our, our sound uh, sober spirit, it, it's important. It's, in, it's important in the, in the marriage relationship. And listen, it, it's important towards our prayer life and because prayer is the heart of life. Prayer is the, it's the heart of our power. I'm not talking about the formal prayers that get prayed when we stand up here and we say, oh, brother, so-and-so lead us in prayer. Not that prayer. You know what I'm talking about? Just that time in your life where you can be riding the lawnmower, you can be out hoeing in your garden, you can be working in your wood shop, you can be driving down the highway. Have you ever just driven down the highway and you and you ride along talking to God? Amen. And people are looking over there at you? <laughs> See, these, he, he's not talking about this prayer being the heart of our life and the heart of our power in these formal prayers when we're, when we're called upon. But he's talking about this living communion with God. This, this ongoing communion. And, and, and you say, well, where does that come from, preacher? It comes from protecting our minds from the world's junk and thinking God's thoughts. I hate to admit this to you, but I'm fixing to. I wish I could tell you this happened every day. I wish I could tell you it happened every few days. But there are just some times, you may want to fire me because I may be the abnormal one here. There are just some times in this walk with the Lord. It's not when I'm in the pulpit on Sunday morning. It's not even when we're back here as much as I enjoy Wednesday nights, but it's in those times when I have my door shut and I'm sitting there and I'm reading the Word of God. And then he just begins. It's the nearest thing to him speaking audibly that I will probably ever experience unless, as I said Sunday, unless he says something to me when I, got, when I get there. And about the only thing I can imagine that he would say to me when I get there is he said, you're lucky to got in, son. <laughs> he said, you, it's kind of like passing English in junior high. You got by by the skin of your teeth. That may be what he tells me. You got in here on the skin of your teeth, Steve. But whatever it is, but when, when you're just sitting there having this communion with God, riding down the road, sitting studying his word, it's that time when it's almost like that, that, that I'm sitting in this chair and it's almost like that he's sitting in that chair. And man, it's just a sweet time. Just so sweet. But that time doesn't happen when this is cluttered, pardon this word, with the world's crap. It happens when I have protected my mind. It happens when I have shielded my mind. It happens when I have taken all of the stuff, and preachers have stuff in their mind just like everybody else does. It's when we take all the stuff, get rid of it, and get our minds and our hearts stayed upon him, and we begin to live in personal holiness and because that is the instruction for us if we're going to live and do our Christian duty. The second thing that we're supposed to do is love. He says this in verse 8 and look look at the first two words of verse 8. He said above what? All. Oh. It's not second, it's not third, it's not one and a half. He said above all keep fervent in your love for one another. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. Aren't you glad of that? And, and listen, we know that his love covers a multitude of sin. But who is who's Peter talking to? He's talking to all these people. He's 
He's talking to all these people that are on the run for their faith because they've been chastised and, and done ugly and all of those things. And he says, hey, above all else, he says, you keep fervent in your life. You say, well, well what's that? Listen, I, I couldn't tell you anything about love that, that another preacher, another teacher, another writer hasn't spoken of that would be volumes better than what I could do. But the word that I find interesting here precedes the word love, and it's the word fervent. Fervent. It's easy to love people who are easy to love. <clears throat> Let me tell you about this word fervent. It's the Greek word ectens. And it's an anatomical word. That just comes from the word, our word anatomy. That word, it means to be stretched and to be strained. So he is not talking about, because it, we don't have to be reminded. I like Wilburn, too. I'm going to tell you I do. I, I've known Wilburn since I was, I don't know, Margie, Wilburn, since I was 8 or 10 years old. If my lawnmower blade needs sharpening, you know what I do? I go to Wilburn Tudor's house. And Wilburn's kind of like your daddy. You, 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 you'd never know quite enough that your daddy just lets you do things. So last time I went down there, I started trying to raise the lawnmower with his winch thingy, and, and I was going to grind the deal, and he had just had, what did you have done? Pacemaker? Yeah, had pacemaker. The doctor said, don't be doing any of that kind of stuff. Well, I started doing that. It wasn't a minute or two later, and I'm sure it needed to be done. He said, don't tell Margie. <laughs> but he took that grinder, and I never got it back. So it's easy for me to love Wilbur T. And it's easy for me to love you, but that's not what Peter's talking about here. He says, you love people who you have to work hard at loving. He's, th this word, it's used several different ways, or a couple anyway. One, it's used of a runner. Not a runner like me. Now, you could just, don't picture this, it wouldn't be pretty. But if I were to put on a little runner's outfit, and I were to go up here to the school or around the parking lot, and I, if I ran, full speed would be a very relative term. But when he is talking about loving fervently, that word is used of a runner who is running at maximum output with their taut muscles straining and stretching to the limit. It's not when they get to the finish line and when they're lunging out to break the tape. It's when they're in the midst of the race. And in the midst of the race, they're at full speed, and they're straining and they're stretching to get there as fast as they can. It's used in a non-biblical way in literature, speaking of a horse. And it's talking about that horse straining. Horses have some crazy muscles. And he's talking about when, it, when it's used that way in literature, it's talking about a horse straining their great muscles running at full speed. And what Peter's talking about here, he is talking about something that's intense. He is talking about something that is strenuous. He is talking about something that is, that is talking about us reaching as far back as we can reach to, to the limit of our capacity. He says, that's how you love people. So, preacher, who's included in that group? It's those people that we have decided ourselves that we can't love them. Because of, and, and we have valid reasons. I'm not here to argue anybody's reasons. But I'll shoot straight with you. There's people that I don't. I'm not going to call them and invite them to dinner. You can't believe a preacher would say that, can you? You say, well, you never invited me to dinner. <laughs> He says, you love those people that you have to, that you have to work at loving. And let, let, let me give you this. Uh, we may not get to that. Yeah, we will. A third thing he said, if, you, you, if you're going to live your Christian duty, live a life of holiness, live a life of love. We're probably not ready for this one, but I've got to give it to us because it's part of the council. You live a life of service. You live a life of service. Now, here's, here's the reading in verse 10 and then part of 11. 
As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Now, probably, and, and more than anything else, he is probably talking about some the spiritual gifts, and we kind of know what those are. That's not our discussion tonight. But our, our, our discussion tonight is more to do with what does this mean in its basest level. Now again, we're not going to care for this much. But here's what it means in its basest level. You say, preacher, how, 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 do, we, how, how do we serve? How do we serve? Well, the, the word serve comes from, and I can't think of what the, it's diakone or something like that is, is the word. You know what it means? To wait on people. You know what idea that carries? In our culture, it would be it would be the idea of a table waiter. But it even has a it even has a baser meaning than that. In the restaurant that you go eat at, he would be talking about the bus boy. It's only about one time you're in a restaurant. There's only about one, maybe twice, that you think about the bus boy. One is if you sit down and your table's dirty. And you think, why didn't he clean this table? The other time that we think of it is when we go in a restaurant and they tell us it'll be 15 minutes before we can get a table. But then you look around that restaurant and there's 12 empty tables, but they're empty, but they have dirty dishes all over them. And you, you begin to think in your mind, where's the bus boy? Listen to me. Peter said, if we're going to live an effective Christian life, we've got to be willing to serve. It's not hard to get people to do the big jobs. It's not hard to get people to do the job that everybody's going to see and everybody's going to notice and you get a plaque card and, and you get your name written up. And it, it's not easy. It's not hard to get somebody to do that. Here's what Peter said. And I believe if he had had opportunity, he could have sat every one of them down, had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, and looked every one of them in the eye and repeated the same thing. He said, if you're going to live the effective Christian life, you've got to be willing to be a busboy. You know what the busboy does? The busboy does things that that girl that meets you at the door at the restaurant, she's just there to preach. She's just there to have a smile on her face and say, Welcome to, where did we eat last night? Welcome to Outback. We only go there because we get gift cards from church at birthday and Christmas. That's, that's why we went there. So, And by the way, Donna said we was running low of those, so if you just have love in your heart, <laughs> it, it's good for the diet. You can get, you can get dietetic stuff there if, if you're careful. But you've got to be willing not to be the, not to be the greeter, not to be the, or, or the hostess, not to be the, the waitress, because the waitress is going to get tips. Going to get not much salary, but going to get some tips. But that bus boy, he ain't going to get nothing but the mess that you left on the table. That's what he's going to get. He's going to get what you leave when you've done all the damage. You ever eat and got up on the table and said, I've done all the damage I can do? That's what the bus boy gets. He gets the results of all the damage that you can do. And brother, listen, this is not a mistake. And I believe this from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. If you, are going, if, if you or I are going to be an effective Christian, if we're going to live an effective Christian life, we may not be the bus boy, but we've got to be willing to be the bus boy. Amen. You say, well, preacher, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, let me give you, I'm not a rocket scientist. Ah. Graduating class, graduated in May of 1981, just across the street in the football stadium. There was 408 of us. I was number 204. 
I was either the dumbest part of the smart half of the class or I was the valedictorian of the dumb half of the class. I'm not sure which I was, and I've wavered both ways, and I've, I've gone both ways, and, and, and I've done both things. But, but there, there, are, there are people that think this is, I am, you know, I have done this in life, and I've done this in life, and I don't do those things anymore. You hear me, brethren. If you're going to live an effective Christian life, you've got to be willing. I'm not the smartest pencil in the box, but you don't have to go far and you don't have to look hard to see some things that need to be done. And when you see some things that need to be done, we don't need to all, because there are people, and listen, the church has people like this. They say, well, send somebody to do it. That may be God's job for you to do. You say, well, I ain't doing that. It's going to be a chink in your armor of your effective Christian life because you're not willing. You're not willing. So if we're going to live an effective Christian life, we've got to be willing to serve. We've got to be willing to be the bus boy. And, and, and then let, let me give you this. I know I'm about two minutes old. Then he gives us the intention part of it. Why, why do we do this? Why, why do we, we have this incentive? Jesus is coming soon. We have this instruction. Live holy. Live a life of love. Live a life of service. You say, why do we do those things? Here it is. Ready? End of verse 11. That in all things. You ready? God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ. To whom belong the glory and the dominion. Forever and ever. Roland and Debbie gave me a little, is it a refrigerator magnet? You gave me a crystal? Gave me a little magnet. I've got it sticking under my computer, setting up. And uh, I see it more there than I would at home. But uh, on this thing, it says, can I get an amen? And Peter comes to the end of this thing, and he's just told these people. He said, you live in light of the second coming of Jesus Christ. He says, he, the instruction is you live holy, you live, you live a life of love, you live a life of service. And then he said, here's the reason why. It's so that God can be glorified in all things. And then undoubtedly, this must have been a Baptist church. Because Peter had to turn around. Nobody else said amen. And Peter said, amen. You know what amen means? It's not just the end of a prayer. So be it. Let it be. Lord, Lord of, of my life, let me, let me live every day like it's the last day that I would ever live. Whether that would be that that death angel come knocking at my door or the day that, that you broke the clouds of the sky and come back and raptured your folks out of here and took the church out, whether it be that way. He said, let me live every day as in that's the last day and let me live holy let me live a life of love let me love those that it's hard to love let me love those I've got a strain at it I have to work at it let me love those people let me serve whatever I need whatever I see that needs to be done give me a heart to do it not so I can get a plaque to hang on the wall, but that you can be honored and glorified because you're the one who deserves all the honor and all the glory. Amen. And then Peter said, so let it be in my life. I can't speak for anybody else in this room. I can only speak for mine. And my prayer would be the same as Peter ended up this little part of that verse of Scripture. So let that be in my heart and my life. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. For this section of scripture that challenges us, reminds us, might be the last one. Lord, I, I 
little piece of paper under the glass on my desk. It says, let me go preach this sermon like it'll be the last one that I ever preach. Let us live tomorrow. Let us finish living today as though it may be the last one so that you could be honored and glorified in all that we do. Dismiss us under your watch and care. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.